Hello, everybody. I think we'll get started now. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, this lecture on praxeology. Uh, I should say, as you'll soon discover if you don't know already, I, I don't have a very loud voice. So uh, if you can't hear, please let me know. You're probably better off if you don't hear, but that's a choice up to you. Uh, one thing uh, I'm going to be lecturing on mainly uh, the first uh, 140 or so pages in human action, which is the part of human action that students find very difficult, especially, I would say, especially you'll probably find this if you read the first 140 pages of human action, you'll probably find this not very easy to follow in all respects, at least if you're like uh, most of the students who've been coming through here in the past 35 years or so. Uh, so my job is to, as, you, as I say, it's a very difficult uh, uh, part of the book for most people to understand, and my job is to make it even more difficult. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we might want to ask, uh, why do we have to study praxeology? It's a, a it sounds like a, a peculiar word. Mean, praxeology is, means the science of action. What can I do with praxeology? Why do I have to study this? Well, <coughs> you can always uh, open up a praxeology shop. So at least it does have some practical use. But before I uh, go into uh, more seriously, why did, does Mises say that he wants to, instead of talking about economics, why does he talk about praxeology? It's an unusual term. Why does he say he wants to have a science of action? And what he had in mind, as you will uh, remember in uh, the lectures yesterday on subjective theory of value. Uh, before the, the onset of the, uh, uh, sub the subjective theory of value in the 1870s with uh, Menger, uh, Jevons, and Walras, that economists didn't think they could explain uh, all human choice in t uh, by reference to subjective values. They thought that you, they could only explain what uh, producers were doing uh, according to their theory, which was based on a labor cost or cost, more generally cost of production. They couldn't explain consumer behavior. So they, in their view, they could only explain what production in terms of making money, what producers were doing. So sometimes economics was described as the science of wealth. So if economics was uh, characterized in that way, it would be just part of human action. It wouldn't be totally comprehensive. <coughs> and uh, if you if you viewed matters that way, then you could say what, say, conclusions from economics would then have to be uh, uh, brought together with conclusions from other areas. John Stuart Mill, in his Principles of Politi Political Economy in 1847, makes this explicit. He said, well, uh, there's, can, there's an area of production that we can explain through economic theory, but then we have to bring this together with other areas as well, other parts, uh, disciplines. So, <coughs> so economics isn't totally comprehensive. So one of the big aims that in Mises' life was to show that economics is completely general. And this is why he put so much emphasis on 
having this science of human action. Now, uh, one uh, point about praxeology is perhaps the key point is that Mises makes about it is that uh, economics uses a different method from the natural sciences. In the natural sciences, say, uh, taking physics and chemistry as the primary examples, the scientists are looking at particular uh, uh, observations of the world. They have, they're ultimately relying on their sense observations. Of course, they have all sorts of instruments to extend their senses, such as microscopes and telescopes and various other uh, measures, things that they can use. But really, they're relying on sense observation of external objects. Say, their chemist is trying to figure, is trying to figure out how uh, molecules uh, will react when placed in various combinations. And when the chemist is doing that, he is just observing what's going on, as it were, on the outside. He's looking at the, uh, at the molecules through his microscope, trying to, uh, then trying to formulate laws of their interaction. But it isn't as if he can, it isn't as if these uh, molecules have minds that he can know what they're thinking or what they're feeling. As far as we know, at least from the scientists, they don't have any feelings or minds. All that the scientists can do is observe them. And economics, uh, praxeology is different from this that the economist has another way, a, a different way to understand what's going on other than looking at uh, objects from the outside. We have a direct acquaintance with action. Uh, I, I can grasp through experience that I act. And this is a key. The this is perhaps the key theme in human action that human beings act. Now, of course, this raises the immediate question: uh, What do we mean by action? And Mises characterizes action as purposeful behavior, which is exercise of will on the world. Uh, Normally, when we're act acting is something, it isn't a very mysterious concept. It's something we, uh, we're always aware of. We're always acting. Say, uh, you got up this morning and you decided to come to this lecture. That would be an act. You have some end in mind and you think that... Uh, coming, say you want to hear about, learn about praxeology, so you have the view that coming to this lecture will help you learn about praxeology, and you want to do that, so that explains why you came here as opposed to other things you might have done. Action is something that we're, we know we're always doing things. Sometimes actions take, actions can car be carried out over a period of time. Say, for many of you, you have, you have an, the action of wanting to get a college degree. So this involves various sub-actions. So action is a very, very much something that we're all aware of. Uh, in general, an action would consist of some sort of physical motion on the outside. would be we're changing something in the outside world. <laughs> we can have cases where just uh, remaining 
in the position you are as an action. One example I, I like to give, which I heard many years ago in a lecture by the great British philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, was supposing that uh, there's a committee meeting and the chair of the meeting says, will all those who agree with the motion please signify by remaining seated. So if you remain seated, you've agreed with the, you voted yes. So that would be a case where not doing anything is, is an action, namely in that case, the action of voting. But most actions aren't like that. They uh, involve some sort of physical change. Uh, now, Mises distinguishes between behavior in which you control your body, as in the cases I've given, say, you're aware of what you're doing, you have some end in mind, and you're doing that, and reflexes that aren't under your control. Uh, for example, if, uh, if say, uh, you go to the doctor's office for a medical exam, as people my age have to do with more frequency than we would like. Say if a doctor taps your knee with a, with a mallet, your, your leg will automatically jerk out, at least if it's, your reflex is working properly. So that wouldn't be an example of action because it isn't under your control. Uh, one thing uh, Mises, as, as I mentioned, Mises wants this to be, action is a very comprehensive category. So when he's talking about action, when, uh, he doesn't mean only action that uh, we think about very carefully in, a, in advance, we deliberate on, we could also have action, say, from unconscious motives. Uh, Mises uh, was very familiar with uh, Sigmund Freud's psychology. In fact, he and Freud were friends. And he, he, he thought that, say, cases studied by psychoanalysis in which people act from unconscious motives count as action. It isn't that you have to be fully aware of what you were doing, what you're doing when you're acting. It's still an action if, as long as there's, a, you have some goal in mind and you think you, this is the way to achieve it. You have a certain way that you think will get you to the goal. Uh, Now, uh, Mises has a very interesting notion of rational action. It, it, remember, for him, as I've mentioned a number of times already, at, he wants to have an absolutely comprehensive notion, science of action. So if someone were to object to him, look what... Uh, you're talking about only covering certain kinds of actions, maybe uh, rational or calculative action. He wouldn't be very happy about that because that would defeat his whole purpose of coming up with this comprehensive science of action. So what his response there is he weakens the notion of, when we talk about a rational action, he has a very weak notion of rational, and by weak, I don't mean something like uh, bad or ineffective. I'm, I'm using weak the way logicians do, meaning something that isn't, isn't requiring very much. We say something is logically weaker if you can fulfill the, the requirements in, uh, more readily than something that's stronger. Uh, say, if I said uh, something like, uh, to get 
into this lecture, you have to uh, come in and sit down. That would be weaker than saying, uh, to get to this lecture, you have to come in and sit down and pass an examination. That would be a, a stronger premise. So uh, Mises has a weak notion of ir uh, rational action. All that's required is you have a goal and you think that certain means will help you attain that goal. So your action counts as rational as, as long as you use the means because of this belief. Uh, you can be wrong about it, say you think that a particular means will uh, get you a certain end, but in fact you're wrong, it won't. And you could even hold beliefs that would be considered crazy by most people. Uh, for example, uh, supposing someone uh, doesn't like a particular person and he thinks that one way he can injure that person is to make a, a small replica of the person and stick pins in the, in the replica, in the doll. So that would count for Mises as a rational action, even if, as most people believe, that wouldn't be an effective way of injuring people. Uh, although I must say, I've, I've never tried that, so maybe, maybe it would work. You know, <laughs> it's, it's worth a try, <laughs> why not? I, I, have a, I can tell you, but I won't go into detail, I have a number of candidates in mind. <laughs> Now, we now want to get into what I think is one of the most important uh, points. Uh, I've talked about action, what Mises means by action, but do we act or uh, how do we know we act? Now, some people, it seems evident to us that we do act. Uh, you could come up with all sorts of actions that you've done just today or just yesterday, it's, it seems like we're, action is omnipresent in our lives. But some people argue in this way. They say our behavior is determined by physical laws. Given, say, the arrangement of material particles, fields, and forces in the universe at any time, what follows is determined that, say, given certain particles, forces, fields, and so on, then uh, at time T1, say, uh, long before we existed, then it's determined by scientific law, say, that the arrangement of particles and so on at, at now time, at the present time, is also determined. Then we would need to add the, the premise that... Uh, the people's action, people's physical behavior is entirely composed of these forces, particles, and so on. So according to this account, well, given the this arrangement of particles that this is determined, it's fixed, so it's not up to us that we're not really acting because given this arrangement of physical particles and so on, then our behavior is determined. So we're wrong in thinking that it's up to us what we're doing. Uh, now Mises, uh, perhaps to uh, some people's surprise, doesn't reject this view. He doesn't say that's a false view at least in most places, he doesn't say that's a false view. He just says, we don't know that it's true. Uh, in, in any event, even if it is true, we can't carry out the, we can't carry out these calculations and know what people are, what the physical arrangements are, and then 
have laws of correlation where we could tell what people are doing. So he says, this is just speculation. So he's taking human action as what he calls an ultimate given. An ultimate given for him is something beyond which we can't pass, that we don't know at the present time. So what's an ultimate given is can, varies with our knowledge at the time. So he says, at least for now, we don't know that this, uh, this view, deter, this determinist view is true. So we should just go ahead and assume for us, action is an ultimate given. Now, I want to make just a few points about uh, this Mises uh, approach here. There are all sorts of very interesting issues one could discuss about de determinism and freedom, but you'll notice that Mises doesn't get into very much of the philosophical complications. He just says, well, this is something we can't, this determinist view is something we can't know to be true, so let's put it aside. And this, I think, is one of the important theme, uh, it's an example of an important theme in human action that I think people often get wrong. And the reason they get this wrong is they, when they read the book, they see Mises is remarkably uh, uh, aware of philosophy and he's He's read uh, all the great philosophers. He can quote them. He quotes in Latin and Greek, and he quotes uh, Henri Bergson. Uh, he quotes all sorts. Spinoza is one of his favorites. He quotes Hegel, Nietzsche. So he's very familiar with philosophy. But what people forget, I think, sometimes is, or they have a misleading impression that. Uh, Human action is not a work of philosophy. Mises isn't trying to solve the basic ph philosophical problems. He's, he's, uh, d this is, economics is one of the sciences. So Mises isn't going into a detailed analysis of these philosophical issues. He's just trying to clear a space for what he wants to do. Now, uh, that isn't to say, though, that Mises doesn't have some important uh, philosophical ideas. And one of them is his view of causality. He thinks that, say, as I mentioned in explaining action, if we think something is a means to an end, we think it can bring about this end, say, if I think, for example, that uh, 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 running out of this room will get me achieve the end of not having to continue the lecture, then that I think that doing that, running out of the room, will bring about that end. So the philosophical theme here is that causality and action go together. They're interdependent concepts. This is a, a view that you find also that causality and action go together. This is a point that Hans Hoppe, whom I'll be lecturing on tomorrow evening, has stressed very much in his work. And I think it's an important contribution he's made that Mises ties the notion of cause, how we get the concept of cause to human action. And this is a view we find also in the uh, great Austrian legal thinker, Hans Kelsen, who was Mises' lifelong friend. They went to high school together and they actually, uh, they uh, lived, they had the same birth and death dates, 1881 to 1973. So in, in his book, Society and Nature, uh, 
Kelsen also uh, stresses the connection of causality with human action. In his case, he, it's a particular kind of human action that he he thinks is particularly related to causality. But it's a similar it's a similar uh, approach, and we can. I think one uh, project I think would be very interesting to undertake is to show parallels and differences between these two great Austrian thinkers. Uh, now, I want to uh, now raise a, a question that may have occurred to some of you. Uh, I've mentioned several times that we experience action from the inside. I know that I act, but how do I know that other people act, or how does each of you know that other people act? Uh, Mises' answer here, again, he is not trying to solve the philosophical problem of, of, of skepticism or other minds. It's, it's, his answer is pragmatic. He, just, he says, if we act on the, if we go on the assumption that other people have uh, act, then we find this work. So he's not, uh, some of you have probably a number of you have taken uh, philosophy courses and you would have questions like this. Uh, suppose, how do I know that I'm not uh, a brain in a vat that uh, scientists are, are manipulating into thinking that I'm experiencing various things, but in fact, I'm not. I'm just really just lying there, not doing anything, but I think all these things are going on. So how do I know that view is false if in fact it is false? How do I know I'm not in the matrix? Well, Mises is not concerned with questions like that. Remember, he's talking, he's, He's talking about economics. He's talking about one of the sciences. It would seem very odd if, say, uh, imagine that uh, someone says, well, we've got uh, the government is spending, oh, uh, increase the deficit and is spending enormous amount of money. Is this going to cause hyperinflation? Somebody said, oh, well, we can't talk about that yet we haven't even established that there's an external world, so how can, we, how can we answer that question? That isn't what economics is concerned with. And it's also, we're not trying to solve the problem of other minds. We're not saying, well, I know that I have a mind, but maybe all of you were just uh, robots and don't have any any uh, internal consciousness. So I just, I know that I'm acting, but how do I know any of you has, has a mind? Mises is not trying to solve that problem. I remember uh, one of the professors of philosophy at uh, UCLA, Robert Yost, who was, uh, was used to say if somebody asked him, uh, do you believe in other, do you think there are other minds? His answer would be, uh, not many. <laughs> uh, now, we now, uh, in the time remaining, I want to get into the, the difficult stuff. What we've gotten through so far, that's the easy part. Now we're going to get into the harder stuff. If you thought it was bad so far, wait till you hear what's next. Uh, we now come to what's called a priori knowledge. Many people wish they'd never heard that word. Uh, now, uh, a priori knowledge is uh, conceptual and deductive. We're not, if something is a pri known a priori, it can be known to be true apart from experience. So say some examples, suppose I say two plus two equals four. I can know that to be true just by thinking about it. I don't have to keep counting two objects and counting another two objects and then 
counting them all out to see if they add up to four. Now, there were some people uh, that were called the logical positivists or logical empiricists who were a group in Vienna uh, who were active in uh, the 1920s and 1930s, uh, who Mises, uh, to say the least, didn't like very much. So according to some people, uh, a priori knowledge consists only of what's called analytic judgments. Now, an analytic judgment is either a definition or part of a, de a definition or an instance of a logical truth uh, where, uh, where a lot logical truths are viewed as tautologies. Now, what do I mean by tautology? Is a tautology is a statement that doesn't give you any information. Uh, for example, uh, suppose we take the logical truth either it's raining or it's not raining. Uh, that would be an example of the uh, law of excluded middle. So if I say that, I haven't given you any information about the weather. If, say, I, would, I was wondering, uh, is it going to rain later today? And someone says, well, either it will, will be raining or it won't be raining the person hasn't told me anything interesting. So according <clears throat> to the uh, positivists, uh, <clears throat> the uh, a priori knowledge doesn't really, isn't really significant because it doesn't give us any new information about the world. Say again, another example, suppose I say all bachelors are unmarried. That's just part of, uh, uh, since a bachelor is an unmarried male above a certain age, we wouldn't say, a, for example, a three-year-old child is a bachelor, three-year-old male, but so, uh, at least, so we in, we're not, according to the positivists, we're not learning anything if we say that we're just uh, we're just ex 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 giving example how we use words. So, uh, Mises' response to that is that you could make the same claim about math, and in fact, the positivists did make that claim. They said uh, mathematics consists of tautologies. And they were, later problems for this view, with those of you who have studied, uh, uh, say, the Gödel's incompleteness theorem will realize there are certain problems with the view that all mathematical statements are tautologies, but fortunately I'm not going to go into that right now. But Mises says, well, you could make this claim about math, but it's clear that math does give us knowledge. We certainly wouldn't say uh, we're looking at, uh, say, some uh, math book with all sorts of difficult theorems in it. We wouldn't say, oh, well, this is just all tautologies. I'm not getting any information from this. Uh, why did the mathematician bother writing it? Uh, so Mises is, 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 again, his response here, I think, is very much gets to the heart of things. He just says, well, look, uh, you can have this argument, but it's just false because we have this example of math, and this is clearly giving us knowledge, but it isn't. So it's false that uh, a priori knowledge and math, I think, would pretty universally be taken to be an a priori discipline. It's false that a priori knowledge is just, uh, doesn't give us any new knowledge. So uh, Mises then rejects the view that a priori knowledge just consists of certain uh, 
conventions about how we use words. His, his view was that uh, uh, we have certain concepts, such as action, that we, it, we need to, to understand the world, to understand what's going on, we must use these concepts. Say, if I didn't have the concept of action, I wouldn't understand what people are doing. I might see people uh, moving their bodies in various ways, but I would just be viewing it as if, say, a uh, uh, chemist views uh, physical particles. I wouldn't understand what's going on. So Mises, Mises' view, which is derived from Kant in a uh, to a large extent, is that we need to have certain concepts before we can understand what's going on in the world. Now, one thing uh, I find you may have noticed uh, from what I've said so far, I present, the way I presented Mises, is uh, he doesn't use an argument that you'll find many people are using, and you probably encountered this argument, in your studies of Austrian economics, those of you who've uh, taken courses in Austrian economics, uh, sometimes the argument is given that suppose somebody denies that human beings act, suppose somebody says uh, human beings don't act. So his very, the person's very saying that shows that the statement is false in that the person saying that is itself an action. So if I say human beings don't act, I'm acting myself. So then that shows that what I'm saying is false. It would, this is sometimes called a performative or pragmatic contradiction. Uh, for example, uh, examples of this, there are many sorts of examples. Suppose I say, Suppose I say in English, I've never uttered an English sentence. My saying that, uttering that sentence in English shows that what I've said is false. So uh, many people these days take that to be the key move in uh, understanding, in, in demonstrating that human beings act, they say, well, if you deny it, you're refuting yourself in this way. Now, the, uh, Mises doesn't make that argument. It's not that there's something wrong with the argument, but he just, that isn't the way he, he does. He, he does make argue that we actually just says, well, it's evident that we act. We know this from experience. And we uh, and we have no good reason to deny that we act. The various deterministic theories are just speculation. It's an ultimate given for us that we act. And I think we, we could see he has, there's a point, a considerable point to what he's doing because suppose we take this uh, pragmatic inconsistency argument as I say, it's a, it's a good argument, but all it shows is that there, at, there's at least one action. It isn't a, com it, it doesn't show that action is central to understanding human behavior. So the real way to go here, I think Mises is quite correct, is that it's known in experience that we add. Uh, I now want to go into a, a, difference, a difference between uh, Mises and the, uh, the other greatest of the two great economists of the 20th century, uh, Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard had a, a somewhat different answer uh, from Mises to how we know how, why we have a priori knowledge. And Mises, I mean, Rothbard, like Mises, says we know that people act 
because we see that they do. Uh, uh, the, uh, the senses, say, uh, present us, uh, uh, sometimes we can directly see that people are act, acting. According to Roper, say, uh, when we sense the external world, uh, it isn't just that we can see various colors, shapes, and so on, but the mind can abstract from what it sees and come up with generalizations, come up with concepts. For example, we can judge that a color isn't a shape. Say, say we see, uh, say imagine we see a, a red round ob a shape. We can distinguish just by sent by abstraction. Uh, between the color and the shape of the object. And taking this further, uh, Rothbard says that we can grasp not only the difference between colors and shapes, but we can grasp that there are things in the world, things that have essential properties. So the mind, the human mind can see directly that human beings act because we abstract this from the senses. We see that this is an essential property of human beings that they act. We grasp it immediately. So the distinction between Mises and Rothbard on this point is that the way understanding why people act is that according to Mises, I've explained. Uh, concepts are something like a grid that people have that they impose on an external world that they are able to uh, understand the world by by seeing the world within by using these concepts. Without these concepts, we wouldn't understand what's going on. But for Rothbard, the concepts aren't. Uh, uh, something like a, a, a grid or something between us and reality, but the concepts present the object as it actually is. Uh, so in this way, uh, Rothbard is like the empiricist in, in that he takes all our knowledge to start with what's given to the senses, but he disagrees with the empiricists. Remember, the empiricists think that everything in that we know about the world is contingent. That's to say, it could be otherwise. So, the empiricists would like uh, would say, uh, like the logical positivists say, well, we can certainly. Rothbard is right. We can certainly know things about the external world by observing them. But these won't be telling us what must be the case. This is just contingent. It could have been otherwise. Say, I could see human beings. Maybe I could see that human beings act. But I couldn't see that human beings necessarily act. This, this is a necessary property about, of human beings. But Rothbard disagrees with that. So he says, if in fact it's necessary that human beings act, and this is something we can grasp through knowing, seeing that human being, by abstracting from what we see, we grasp that human beings act, we can say that it's an a priori truth in the sense that it's, a, we know this by thinking about it, but our thinking about it isn't separated from our external perception. It isn't that we have some conceptual uh, logic that we've imposed on the world. We just grasp that human beings act in this way. So we can call it a, a necessary truth and we could define, we could characterize an 
a priori truth as one that's necessary in this way and that would be necessary in uh, in the sense that it's synthetic it gives us knowledge about the world so it's a synthetic a priori truth but it's very different from uh, synthetic a priori as understood by the in Kantian philosophy you'll notice Mises never in fact uses the term synthetic a priori in human action uh, so I'll just conclude by Another point Rothbard makes, and Mises would certainly agree with this, is that praxeology is conducted in ordinary language. It wouldn't be an advantage to formalize praxeology using mathematical logic. And the reason for this is that in praxeology, we need to understand every step of the argument, not... Uh, just to follow a mechanical procedure, say, if we have in, uh, say, in a mathematical equation, we could solve it. In certain case, my case, I probably wouldn't be able to solve it. But if we could solve it, we could solve it by some sort of certain rules that we would just follow automatically, and we would be interested in the conclusion, but we wouldn't know. The each step of the proof wouldn't have a separate meaning. So Rothbard stresses that in the study of praxeology, we want to understand every step of what's going on. Uh, so this is, is Kant has this notion, I was called this is an extensive proof. And so this is why in praxeology we don't. Uh, use mathematical logic but rely on ordinary language so i think i'll i'll stop now i hope i've given you some idea of some of the basic concepts of praxeology and succeeded in confusing you at least a little bit thank you <laughs>